the relationship between peace operations and humanitarian assistance. We're asking the broad question, enabling or harmful? Uh, this is a webinar jointly organized by the Norwegian Center for Humanitarian Studies, which is a, uh, a joint center between uh, NUPI, the Norwegian Institute for International Affairs, PRIU, the Peace Research Institute Oslo, and the Christian Mikkelsen Institute in Bergen, so three, three Norwegian research centers in this area. Um, and of course, the, the effectiveness of, of Peace Operations Network, uh, which we are coordinating at NUPI, but that involves more than, than 40 research institutions from, from across the globe. And uh, this topic, uh, we thought, is, is a nice way to bring these two networks together uh, in the effectiveness of Peace Operations Network. Uh, we do research into specific contemporary peace operations. Uh, uh, my colleague Jenny will put the EARPON website on the chat function for those of you that are that are not familiar with um, the EARPON. And uh, we are going to talk about uh, three uh, contexts today where we have uh, recently done uh, EARPON studies. Uh, so uh, one of our panelists, Lise Howard, is the uh, lead author for the effectiveness peace operations study on the Central Africa of the UN mission in the Central African Republic, MINUSCA. Uh, that will be published uh, soon uh, on the NUPI website, sorry, on the EARPON website. And uh, we have uh, published a study on the uh, UN mission in the Democratic Republic of Congo earlier. Uh, and today on the panel, uh, Carlo Kurs from the Christian Mikkelsen Institute. Uh, we'll talk about uh, the DRC context. And then we are also joined by Natasha Rupesinger from NUPI. She was part of the team, the EPON team that did a study on the United Nations mission in Mali, MINUSMA. So that's the kind of EPON context. And then, of course, in the context of uh, the Norwegian Center for Humanitarian Studies, we have various colleagues and participants joining us who uh, are looking at this more from the perspective of the Unitarian Assistance community. And so that's why we thought this would be a great way of bringing these two communities together uh, in the form of, of this webinar today. And of course, when we, uh, most, most peacekeeping operations, at least multidimensional peacekeeping operations, uh, have as part of their mandate to provide protection to humanitarian actors, uh, to provide assistance, to humanitarian actors. And of course, we are interested to know how effective is that, is that assistance? Is the peacekeeping operations uh, you know, doing a meaningful, um, uh, is effective doing a meaningful task in that process? And uh, we would especially like to hear from, from the humanitarian community and from humanitarian perspectives, how they perceive this relationship with uh, peacekeeping operations or peace support operations. One of the studies we did uh, in Iapon is also, for instance, on the African Union mission in Somalia. And we are doing uh, studies also this year on, uh, on OSCE and EU missions in Ukraine. So we're not looking only at, at the uh, UN peacekeeping operations, although they've been the bulk of the studies thus far. So we're interesting to find out in this, in this panel discussion, you know, are there uh, challenges around this relationship and, and what, may they, what may they be? And we'll have this uh, introduction by the panel that I've, in, that I've mentioned now. And then we have the opportunity to have uh, two commentaries by uh, Christopher Leiden from PRIU and Kari Osland from NUPI, who will act as discussants and help us to set the scene further. And then we're going to open up to, to, to everyone that has uh, been able to join us for comments, for discussion. Um, and then right towards the end, we're also going to post a poll where we're going to ask you your view of uh, whether you think this relationship is more uh, harmful or challenging or whether it's more complementary. So it'll be good to, at that point, to, to get your view in the form of a poll or a survey as well. And we've also done the same on, on Twitter. So for those of you that are on Twitter, please participate in that poll as well. So that's by way of, of setting the scene. We're delighted to, to have all of you with us this afternoon. And uh, I'm going to uh, start the panel now. So first off, I'm going to introduce uh, 
Carlo Kurs from the Christian Mikkel Institute. He's going to share with us his views, partly situated around the context of the Democratic Republic of Congo, but he's also done research in Liberia and elsewhere. So it'll be very interesting to, to hear your perspectives, Carlo. You've got the floor, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, let me share a few slides. Um, yeah, thank you for inviting me to this, uh, to this Zoom seminar, uh, Cedric. So one thing uh, I want to say before I begin, so um, just that you know, I'm not what I would call a country expert <clears throat> or area specialist. I have done research on the DRC for the last 10 years and have some ongoing research projects, but I'm also doing research on other countries. So I may not have the in-depth knowledge that people have that focus purely on the DRC. So if there are people who are country specialists, please, uh, and you have some diverging views, I suspect you're probably correct in case you, you find yourself in this situation. Okay. Um, so the question uh, or the invitation to, to comment about whether UN peacekeeping and humanitarian assistance or action in the DRC is a harmful or enabling in, uh, relationship, I think is, is, is not that easy to answer actually. And I would probably say that it's at the moment at least a sort of a necessary relationship where humanitarian assistance actually quite uh, is, or most humanitarian actors rely on peacekeeping forces and their services. So I want to structure my, my short talk in, in three parts. The first part would look a little bit like um, give you a bit of a context of why, why humanitarian assistance is really necessary in the DRC, particularly in the eastern part, but at the same time why it is so challenging and difficult actually to establish, especially during the last 20 years. It's interesting actually that in the first five years of the conflict, so basically right after the genocide in Rwanda and the exodus of, of the uh, Hutu genocide into the Eastern Congo, there basically was no peacekeeping force and humanitarian actors basically um, provided humanitarian assistance by themselves without the help and support both in terms of security but also logistical uh, support by the United Nations peacekeeping mission. So just to give you a brief idea about, about the context and here we are talking about not the last 20 years, just the last 12 months, what, what happens in terms of, of violent conflicts in North and South Kivu. So these are the two areas, the two provinces that were most affected by uh, armed conflicts during the last 25 years. Now there have been uh, some new provinces that um, experienced more violent conflict like the Kasai region more in the center, but we will focus here on North and South Kivu today. So just in the last 12 months, and please note that this is considered a post-conflict context, actually, so not, not a, a conflict context. So 677 violent clashes, uh, around uh, 700 people killed, 38 uh, events of mass rape, uh, 200 abductions, and uh, just in the first half of 2020, 1 million people displaced, newly displaced, just in the eastern part. So that's quite a lot, right? Um, now, what is the underlying reason for that? So, of course, there's a quite a long history of, of, uh, of that explains, at least to some degree, this sort of insecurity. But one problem with that is quite domestic is actually that we have, uh, well, a large and basically continuously growing number of armed groups in the eastern parts. And here you see a little bit. So basically, this here is kind of a list of their names, right? So very often these have uh, sort of uh, acronyms or uh, many of them are kind of fragmented groups uh, that further fragment and, and build alliances, fragment again and again and again. And, and you have some conditions in the, in the East that kind of facilitate or incentivize this fragmentation actually. So you have of course a lot of like these uh, quite valuable natural resources that are conducive for uh, armed groups. So you can do artisanal mining. So where you don't need a lot of infrastructure or equipment. There's a lot about uh, local taxing, roadblocks, where armed groups can generate income. Of course, they will have a proliferation of small arms in, in, in the whole region. They are not just in, in the eastern part of, of, uh, of Congo. And 
many of these, in addition to add-on, uh, we have very low state capacity and a low projection of state authority apart from the few urban areas. So there is like all these conditions create incentives actually for armed groups to emerge. Now these armed groups are often quite heavily invested and, and allied and associated with their local communities. So they're not necessarily bandits or, or rebels in that sense, but somehow provide security because state security forces often don't do that. They're rather perpetrators in that sense. So these conditions, what does that have to do um, with um, humanitarian aid? So on this one hand, it generates a really high degree of uncertainty. And this is of course relevant if you think about humanitarian actors in terms of staff safety, in terms of how you can deliver humanitarian aid in relatively remote areas. So basically what it does, it deteriorates humanitarian access and space in, in this area where it is needed most. Now, another point that may come in addition is actually the topography. So I just plotted a few pictures from um, basically some from the internet, some from, from my own pictures. So you have a lot of like, you have few roads during the rainy season. It's very difficult to transport people and goods. Um, so the few big humanitarian actors that have, for instance, planes or, or have, have, have um, cargo lorries that go through these uh, muddy roads during rainy seasons are typically MSF, so Médecins Sans Frontières, the International Rescue Committee or um, ICRC. But many of the smaller ones, many of the smaller humanitarian um, aid providers don't have these resources, right? So um, this is quite, makes it quite difficult for humanitarian actors to deliver aid in remote areas. Now the role of the UN and the UN mission in Eastern Congo is called MONUSCO since 2010 uh, is, as Cedric mentioned, is to protect civilians, but also to support humanitarian assistance. And we know from the general literature, and of course that's the whole goal of, of peacekeeping missions, uh, that this works. It doesn't work perfectly, but it at least has a positive inf impact in reducing violence, in particular aspects of uh, the number of casualties, it shortens periods of violent conflict, and it also kind of um, avoids uh, diffusion. There's also some papers on that better trained and better educated peacekeepers improve protection of civilians, and also that the UN is quite um, effective actually when they engage in local level mediations uh, with uh, communities, that this also reduces intergroup violence. Now, this is more from the more comparative literature. The uh, mission in Eastern Congo is, is very large. And I think as far as I know, it's, it's the largest UN mission um, at the moment or ever. Uh, so with around 15,000 military troops, um, 18 offices. So just I listed a few activities. So that, that shows that uh, the UN, albeit it gets a lot of criticism, it has actually a lot of activities, right? So it does its military, military patrols, um, engages in local level reconciliation efforts, and quite importantly, but I think very often forgotten actually, it uh, provides logistics to humanitarian actors. So if you wanna travel in many of these remote areas, it's very, very difficult actually. Um, I've experienced that myself and the UN basically supplies a uh, airlifting network that uh, offers to um, fly people, but also goods and supplies. And that's really what you need actually in when you want to operate in such a context. So how does that affect um, local peace? It's very difficult, we know that, right? So how can you establish the effectiveness of a peacekeeping force without a good counterfactual, right? Typically it's very difficult or basically completely impossible and unethical to maybe run a experiment or something like that to establish whether UN uh, peacekeeping missions would improve um, security, peace building. But basically we know from observational studies that this works, right? The interesting thing is actually it doesn't really um, come into the perception of the local population. So there is um, the um, Harvard, uh, Harvard Humanitarian Initiative runs surveys uh, since several years 
um, on people's perceptions of peace, on people's perceptions of justice, and, and several other key themes actually. And I've, I've, I wanted to show you some of them. So this is basically, uh, it stands for North Kivu, South Kivu, Ituri. Let's just take the total. So this is a, a survey poll that asks regularly around 7,000 people. So it's really a large sample and gives us quite good estimates actually. So this here is for instance, a question that has been asked over several years on people's perceptions of peace in their neighborhood and village. Now we can of course discuss how, um, how exact or accurate this question is, but it just gives you a sense how low, even though we are talking about a post-conflict context, how low people's perceptions of peacefulness is, right? So just about a quarter actually thinks that within their village and neighborhood there is peace. This is constant over time, right? Um, one minute warning. How many? About one minute, maybe. Yeah. Okay, that's good. Um, and a similarly interesting point is actually if you think about peace building efforts by the UN, by other humanitarian actors, very few people, just around six percent, ten percent, see this as a positive contribution to peace in Congo. So we have very negative views actually at the local population. So just. Let me run my, my preliminary non-inclusive uh, um, um, conclusion. So I think it's not either a um, enabling or, or difficult relationship, it's at the moment a necessary relationship. So armed conflict is certainly one of the key sources of human suffering in the Eastern DRC for the last 25 years. And at the same time, this armed conflict and insecurity limits space and access to most humanitarian NGOs, except maybe a few large humanitarian actors like MSF or ICRC. So the other thing is that most humanitarian agencies today, they have really quite limited organizational capabilities. They have limited independent funding, they have high staff turnover and limited bargaining power with state authorities, but also with rebels, militias, and so on, because typically they are often implementing partners with very little autonomy. And MONUSCO actually has not only the mandate to protect civilians, but also support humanitarian actors to provide this vital logistical support. So I think that really pins down why the UN mission, at least in Eastern Congo, is so critical. Is MONUSCO fulfilling its mandate? It gets a lot of um, criticism, especially from the local population. Um, it's not perfectly, but as I said, we don't have a really good counterfactual of what would happen if the UN mission would not be there. And my assumption would be that it would be much worse. Last point. So I think without MONUSCO, most humanitarian actors in the Eastern DRC would be unable to provide humanitarian relief programs to most of the population that is away from the urban centers and areas. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Carlo. Very interesting uh, and uh, interesting overall conclusion that, uh, you know, it's it maybe a necessary relationship. Uh, you, you explained and you concluded how the presence of MONUSCO is, is uh, kind of maybe a critical enabler for uh, humanitarian actors, uh, which doesn't mean that everything is, is going perfect and, and it can't be better, but that's a, a interesting uh, and a useful finding to kick us off. Um, what you discussed and also the focus, especially on the kind of logistics and uh, supporting element in addition to the protection, also reminded that reminded me that perhaps we haven't mentioned in the beginning, but of course, uh, OCHA, the Office for the Coordination of Humanitarian Affairs, have a specific uh, set of policies around civil military coordination and about guidance to especially uh, military or security support to humanitarian assistance. So those of you that are interested in that and not familiar with that can go and look at that. And of course, on the UN side, there's a specific UN CIMIC or civil military coordination policy as well that speaks partly to, to, to this dimension or relationship with humanitarian actors as well. But let's go to, to uh, Natasha for maybe a, a quite a, a significantly different context uh, in the context of Mali. So uh, Natasha, you can unmute and, and, and uh, introduce us to the Mali context. Thank you so much. Uh, 
And Natasha, we can't hear you in case you're speaking. Maybe just make sure you're unmuted. I think I'm unmuted now. Yes. No, you, yes, you are. Okay, um, and you can see the slide. Perfect. I guess we can see the slide. Okay, so um, I'm going to be talking about um, MINUSMA. As Cedric mentioned, um, I was part of the team uh, going uh, to Mali in 2018, um, in July and September, where we had the chance to visit Bamako, um, but also we had uh, teams going to central Mali and Mopti, um, as well as Gao in the north. Um, so just to sort of set the, the scene a little bit, and I'm going to start with a similarly kind of bleak picture of the very multifaceted and also rapidly deteriorating humanitarian crisis in uh, Mali. Um, so problems of humanitarian access are incredibly complicated, um, similarly to in the DRC, and this really varies per region. Um, and difficulties of accessing um, communities um, can be impacted by armed conflict, criminality, intercommunal violence, um, the presence of IEDs, as well as poor infrastructure and seasonal flooding. This makes it a very, very uh, complicated mission area. Um, and unfortunately, the, the situation is uh, deteriorating. So OCHA has projected that this year, 6.8 million um, are in need of humanitarian assistance. So this has more than doubled since last year. Um, since 2017, also the numbers of internally displaced people um, has significantly risen. So from 38,000 in 2017 to now 287,000. In addition, um, there are serious problems related to the closure of schools due to insecurity. So 3.8 million children are affected by these school closures. Um, you have um, huge issues related to food insecurity. And now COVID is also um, complicating the situation, putting more pressure on the health infrastructure. Um, Unfortunately, also the trends of conflict and violence um, are not looking good. Um, levels of conflict in Mali have significantly deteriorated since uh, 2016. You can see in the image um, on the left hand side there, um, the number of conflict events is really cross clustered around sort of the central regions um, of the country. And an another interesting trend is that anti-civilian violence perpetrated by both non-state armed groups and the state has actually increased um, significantly. So this creates a very sort of um, difficult uh, protection crisis for the mission um, as well as humanitarian actors to deal with. So uh, just to give a brief overview of sort of MINUSMA's mandate and the context which it, which it operates in, which I think makes it quite a unique uh, mission. Um, so its current strategic priorities are really the implementation of the, the Malian peace agreement, which essentially addresses um, the conflict in the north uh, between the, the rebels and the, uh, the armed actors on the government side. Um, but since 2018, actually, the mission has set a second strategic priority, which is the stabilization of central Mali. Um, and connected to these two strategic priorities, the mission also is mandated to facilitate the delivery of humanitarian assistance and protect civilians. Um, MINUSMA also has a robust mandate um, to anticipate, deter and counter threats, including asymmetric threats. Um, but I think what makes this a really unique mission is the fact that it operates in the context of on ongoing counter-terror operations, where MINUSMA cooperates in different ways with a wide range of security actors, um, including the Malian Security and Defense Forces. Um, you have the French counter-terror operation Barkhane, which operates across uh, Mali and other countries in the Sahel. You have two EU training missions, which are there to uh, train the Malian police and the military. Um, you have the joint force of the G5 Sahel, which consists of neighboring countries uh, engaged in fighting terrorism and organized crime in the border regions between Mali, Burkina Faso, and Niger. 
And in addition to that, you have now the Takuba, which is, um, consists of Euro European special forces, which have now started deploying in, 20, in July 2020. And they are specifically focused on fighting terrorist groups such as the Islamic State in the Greater Sahara operating in the Liptako Gorma area. Um, and just to sort of put this in perspective, um, a report came out last year by Refugees International where they actually estimated the amount of military funding um, of the G5 Sahel, Bahkan and MINUSMA, which amounted to $2 billion per year. Um, and this in comparison to the $160 million provided for the UN Humanitarian Response Plan, which actually had called for $324 million. So I think this number kind of I think concretizes a very widespread perception in Mali, um, particularly among humanitarian actors that overall the stabilization effort in the country is highly skewed towards um, military responses. So um, looking at how effective MINUSMA has been in terms of delivering humanitarian assistance, I think one thing that can be said is that um, up at, up until at least 2016, the mission contributed to enhancing stability in the north, which enabled a large amount of internally displaced persons to return. Um, the second aspect is that, um, similarly um, to the point that was made on DRC, is that the mission is absolutely vital for providing logistical support to areas that cannot be accessed by uh, humanitarian actors. Um, and, and lastly, I think another thing which is interesting about MINUSMA is that it has a very significant um, budget actually for the delivery of quick impact projects. So the QUIPs are actually a very integral part of MINUSMA's stabilization and recovery strategy. Um, and these are actually seen to be sort of prerequisites for other strategic aspects of the mandate, such as implementation of the peace agreement. Um, and these quick impact projects um, are actually considered to be sort of a key, um, very key in filling the gap of, of service provision. Um, but on the other hand, um, a large portion of the budget is actually devoted to sort of security efforts, which involve um, the construction of checkpoints, police stations and camps. And this really sort of fuels the perception that the mission is, is um, there to support the state rather than the needs of the, the Malian people. How do humanitarian actors and MINUSMA uh, coexist, coordinate and cooperate? So the first thing that I should mention here is that MINUSMA has a multi-dimensional mandate um, on like, you know, similar to other peace operations, which means that in addition to the military, it also has civilian pillars to facilitate humanitarian assistance or to support the state in delivering services to the local population. But this sometimes creates tension with humanitarian actors. So the UN country team and humanitarian NGOs, they've been present in the country long before MINUSMA arrived. So at times they perceive the mission to sort of be encroaching on some of their mandated tasks, which can sort of create a bit of a tense relationship at times. Um, however, there are structures in place to facilitate coordination. There is a civil military coordination cell where military and humanitarian actors come together um, and, and, and discuss these issues. However, we also heard um, that often there is a lack of coordination and consultation, um, which leads to a duplication of efforts, especially in the de delivery of quick impact projects. And some actors feel that, you know, MINUSMA should purely focus on delivering quick impact projects in areas where humanitarians cannot go. Um, and lastly, um, on, on cooperation, you know, it's, it's clear that MINUSMA has a value add in terms of providing logistical support. It can also deploy to areas where humanitarian need access. Um, they can patrol in these areas to create a secure and conducive environment for humanitarian aid to be delivered. And then, of course, the issue of armed escorts, which is um, something which is sort of um, really perceived to be something to be used as a very last resort by only by some humanitarian actors in Mali. Um, I think this is perhaps the most interesting part of the presentation. So has MINUSMA unwittingly caused harm? Um, 
MINUSMA is one of the deadliest peace operations uh, in the world. It has become a soft target um, by non-state actors. So there is a perception that its presence alone contributes to insecurity because it increases the, the number of attacks that occur in that area where the mission is deployed. Um, another very important thing to highlight is that because MINUSMA is perceived to be part of the broader military stabilization effort, um, civilians have been reportedly subjected to reprisal attacks by non-state actors because they are perceived to be collaborating with MINUSMA. Um, it, the fact that MINUSMA carries out um, and delivers quick impact projects also blurs the lines between the mission and humanitarian actors. Um, as a result, it's very difficult for, for civilians to actually distinguish between MINUSMA, the counter-terror actors, and humanitarians. Um, and as a result, humanitarian agencies really struggle in preserving their neutrality and independence, um, which really at times can compromise their acceptance and access among local communities when they're perceived to be uh, linked to MINUSMA. And lastly, um, this also means that humanitarian actors are also at risk of attacks by non-state armed actors if they are perceived to be collaborating with uh, the, the mission. So in conclusion, um, I would say that I think um, it is a necessary relationship because MINUSMA can absolutely contribute to facilitating humanitarian access through providing logistical support. Um, and by creating a conducive security environment to facilitate the delivery of humanitarian assistance. And another thing that should be mentioned is that across the board among civil society um, that we spoke to, both in Bamako, Mopti and Gao, it was expressed that, you know, uh, the civilian population expects the mission to deliver humanitarian assistance and development. Um, however, the fact that the mission operates in such a complicated theater where you have a myriad of counter-terror actors um, engaging in military stabilization tasks, um, this does create serious risks for both humanitarians and civilians who are perceived to be collaborating with MINUSMA. And in that regard, um, the, the clearest sort of message that came out um, from the humanitarian actors that we spoke to was that there has to be a much clearer delineation of roles um, and responsibilities, which actors are responsible for what and where. Um, I think that brings me to the end of my presentation. So. Thank you, thank you so much, my Tasha. Um, that was really useful to, to set this uh, um, question that we're discussing about the relationship between peace operations and internal assistance in the Mali context, I think you really sketched for us how, how difficult and complex that, that environment is and the kind of uh, ongoing counterterrorism efforts by the, the, the various actors in Mali kind of puts this context back into the debate that we had you know, maybe a few years ago in the context of Afghanistan and elsewhere, where it was very much about you know, how um, association between military actors and humanitarian actors can impact on on their independence and neutrality and so on so interesting to see how this mali context in a sense forces us back into into that kind of debate um, so very very interesting next we're going to go to uh, lise howard lise is a professor at georgetown university but currently speaking to us from paris and as i mentioned earlier she has been the lead author of the earpon study on the UN mission in the Central African Republic, MINUSCA, that we will release uh, very soon. So Lise, over to you. Great, thank you so much, Cedric, and thank you to uh, the Norwegian Center for Humanitarian Studies and the Effectiveness of Peace Operations Network and NUPI and PRIO. And um, I also wanna get a, give a shout out to my fellow co-author, Ivan Yenda Ilunga, who I see is here on the screen with us. Um, I'll note that he has a new book out today, out today, published today. Congratulations, Yvonne. It's called Humanitarianism and Security. And so uh, I encourage everyone to check it out. Um, it is well worth considering. Okay, 
I don't have a PowerPoint today. I'm going to try to be brief. I'm, I'm mindful of everyone's time and I want to make sure we hear from other folks. Um, so I'm gonna make three points. I'm going to talk about uh, the background of, some of the background of the situation in the Central African Republic. We'll talk briefly about MINUSCA, but we'll be launching that MINUSCA report pretty soon and we'll have an entire session just devoted to, um, to considering that report and the effectiveness of the mission. And then finally, I want to consider the question. Okay, so the thing about the Central African Republic is that I feel that even my African friends and my Africanist friends don't know that much about the country. And so I feel that I must say a few words about it before I launch into discussing our question. Um, the Central African Republic is this beautiful, large uh, country smack in the middle of, of the African content, uh, continent, so it doesn't have an outlet to the sea. Um, it's about the size of continental France or Texas, uh, the US state of Texas for reference. Um, it's rich in natural resources, so there's quite a bit of gold and uh, diamonds and timber and then, of course, the uranium that France used to make its first atomic weapon. And so I will note on this day, um, when many of my colleagues in the United States are on a scholar strike, um, uh, striking for racial justice, that I will note um, that we still have not achieved racial justice in many contexts. And, and most notably in the Central African Republic. So the Central Afri Republic, African Republic endured decades of French concessionary colonial rule. And what that meant was um, most recently, between 1880 and 1920, half of the population disappeared. If we can just consider that for a moment, we talk about a population being decimated when one tenth of the, the people are a die. And in the Central African Republic, if you look at the statistics, the vital statistics in the country between 1880 and 1920, half of the people disappeared. And this was mainly due to slave raiding and trading and also French concessionary political rule, which meant that private French companies controlled uh, the country and controlled that style of colonialism. Um, so I will just note that Central Africans have a completely, if you think about this historical context, this is recent, this is only 100 years ago. There is, um, many people say that there is uh, an, a completely understandable and rational fear of outsiders based on this abusive relationship and, and the import of disease that ex external, you know, that outsiders have brought to the Central African Republic. Anyway, so, just to, to make sure that we're, we're aware of this history. Um, when we want to try to understand why it might be difficult for outsiders to act in this context today. Um, so since independence in 1960, um, Central Africa has been, uh, has remained quite poor. Um, it's had mainly violent, it has had undemocratic political transitions, but Central Africans have never fought each other. Um, in, in to this level that we're seeing of violence um, since 2013. So the violence is still, it still feels quite recent and shocking. It's only since 2013 that we've had, um, uh, that we've had war between Central Africa. So Central Africa has 4.5 million citizens. So it's much smaller, of course, than DRC and Mali. So to note that um, right now, 1.3 million are displaced um, both inside and outside the country. So if you consider that for a moment, that is a quarter of the population. The IDP levels fluctuate by year, um, but the refugee numbers have been holding steady at, at roughly 600,000 um, since 2015. So, uh, so we have under 5 million people in this country and half, 2.4 million, suffer from acute food insecurity. So food, in, food insecurity all, has also been increasing since um, the, the arrival of COVID-19 um, with the border closings between Central Africa and Cameroon and DRC. So we have this, this dire humanitarian situation. Um, 
and at the same time, there are signs of progress, right? We've had democratic elections in 2015. The Central African Republic will have new elections this year that will probably move into 2021 20, um, also. Uh, in February of 2019, uh, Central African, all 14 armed groups um, established uh, a, a peace agreement. And so there has been some progress since the establishment of this peace agreement. So MINUSCA has been working to uh, enable lo local peace agreements, so very local peace agreements, and we have basically two processes happening at the same time, a top-down regional peace process with neighbors focusing on the armed groups and the leadership of the armed groups and, and bottom-up local um, peace committees that, are, that have developed in, in many towns across the Central Africa. Um, nevertheless, armed groups still control about 75% of the territory. So we have a democratically elected leader. He, I think, is quite impressive. He's a math professor. He, he still lives in a modest home. He teaches math every Saturday. He has a lot of women in his cabinet. Um, and, and, yet, um, and yet we still have this situation. Okay, so Consider MINUSCA for a moment. MINUSCA deployed in 2014. It has nearly 15,000 total personnel. So in a country with so few people, if we think about that for a moment, the mission is almost the same size as the mission in DRC, which is several times larger and has many times more people. Um, the MINUSCA budget is about three times the size of the national budget each year. Um, it's over a billion dollars. So it's just, it hovers right around a billion dollars per year. Now, one of the key parts of the MINUSCA mandate is to facilitate um, and protect humanitarian aid work. And so, as in Mali and in DRC, uh, MINUSCA, uh, is, MINUSCA planes fly uh, humanitarian workers and escort humanitarian convoys throughout the country. And that is how humanitarians, are, um, and that's how they enable humanitarians to do their work. I will say at the same time that Central Africa is one of the most dangerous places in the world for foreign aid workers, with attacks on humanitarians occurring an average of one per day um, in last year and this year. Uh, and increasingly, we also see this phenomenon that we've seen, especially in South Sudan, where when people flee violence, they seek refuge near UN bases. So UN, you, you, UN bases themselves become humanitarian sites of humanitarian refuge. Um, another thing that's a little bit unusual about this mission is that um, unlike most pe peacekeeping missions, MINUSCA has a quick react reaction force. And this force usually deploys to protect Central African citizens when there's fighting. Um, but this year, it, it, it deployed to not to protect a couple of times in Bamingi and Birao in Delhi, it deployed to protect humanitarian aid workers. So this is a new um, event in, in among external actors in the Central African Republic that the quick reaction forces are deploying to protect other external actors, to protect humanitarian aid workers. Okay, so to consider very briefly, um, our important and provocative question today, is the relationship between peace operations and humanitarian assistance mainly enabling or harmful? So I will note that in the 1950s, um, uh, peacekeepers decided to start, uh, actually this was in 1948, they started to paint their vehicles white. Now, why did they paint the, ve the UN vehicles white? They changed them from military green and brown and black to white um, to situate peacekeeping, to visually and situate peacekeeping as something that would be more humanitarian than military or somewhere between military and humanitarian, but visually situating peacekeepers as among humanitarians, not putting the red cross or red crescent or, or crystal on the vehicles, but of course with the UN a blue UN U, uh, letters. So um, in the context of the Central African Republic, we have this tension um, where on the one hand, the UN visually looks like a humanitarian actor, but at the same time, Central Africans would like the UN to be more forceful 
in its response to the armed groups. Generally, we see in the Harvard Humanitarian Initiative polling and in other instances that that there is this there is a, a popular idea that MINUSCA should be more aggressive, that it should become more of a military actor. Um, Lise, can I give you one minute, please? Yes, please. I'm sorry. I, I meant to be quick. Okay. So, um, uh, so Central Africa doesn't really have roads, so humanitarians rely on MINUSCA. But at the same time, MINUSCA and the government of CAR rely on humanitarians. So in that sense, you, you can't really separate the three. Everybody is relying on everyone else right now. Um, so they are complementary and necessary, but also obviously problematic. And I will just I will begin also by citing Yvonne's work that I think we need to shift our thinking um, toward empowering people um, on the receiving end of both peacekeeping and humanitarian aid, as opposed to focusing so much on on disputes between uh, peacekeepers and humanitarians. Thank you. Thank you very much, Lise. Um, that was really very interesting to see the, the Central Africa Republic context as well. I mean, I think these are three, three very, uh, very interesting cases, if you like, that, that we looked at. Uh, but I think we've also seen a great uh, commonality in some of the challenges ac across these three cases. Uh, I don't want to go into that uh, a lot because maybe I'll be saying things that our discussants want to say. So I'm going to to hand over first to uh, Kari Oslan, who is a senior research fellow at NUPI uh, and until very recently headed the uh, Peace, Conflict and Development uh, Research Group there. And then after um, Kari, I'm going to hand over to Christopher Leiden, our colleague from Peru. So Kari, first over to you for some comments. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, <clears throat> Cedric. and. Um, I want to start by thanking the three presenters for very interesting uh, presentations and also to apologize for my, my um, I have a cold, so my voice might um, disappear slightly. Um, I thought I would like to present an analytical framework which might serve to explain why the humanitarian and the peacekeeping field not necessarily coexist and serve to assist each other's work. And I will be brief and I will make uh, generalizations and simplifications. So first, and writ large, the center of gravity for people working in peace operations and the center of gravity for humanitarian workers differs. For humanitarian workers, it is to help those most in need, the most vulnerable. For people working in peace operations, protection of civilian is one among several elements of the mandate and alongside with establishing some level of security. Second, and following from this, the mandate of the humanitarian workers is more limited compared to the peacekeepers, who are not only to protect civilians, among others by securing areas and roads so that the humanitarian workers can get access and do their job, but also to perform a number of other duties, such as assisting in reforming the police, rule of law, system training, equipping, and perhaps also fighting insurgency groups, as we know. With reference to the Christmas three mandate discussion. Third, and also following from this, while the humanitarian workers will have a bottom-up approach, working with subnational and non-state actors, peace builders will have much more of a state-centric, top-down approach. Hence, they differ on at least three parameters. First, the center of gravity. Second, mandate and complexity of tasks to be carried out. And third, approach and who they deal with, all which may contribute to explaining the level of divergence or convergence between the humanitarian workers and the peacekeepers. Two final points adding to this is firstly the common weaknesses with large organizations working side by side, but also within multilateral organizations such as the UN, with lack of coordination, with the seal of thinking, the different reporting lines, etc. And secondly, there will always be a hierarchy of priorities, power relations, etc. And the humanitarian efforts does not seem to be in the upper parts of the pyramid. 
And as mentioned initially, this is of course a simplification and generalization for the sake of the analytical argument. And as has already been mentioned by the three presenters, there are a number of UN components which have mandates and modes of interaction with subnational actors. For instance, the UN Civil Affairs Section, and even for instance, parts of UN policing focusing on community-oriented policing. It's just not very present in the literature on the topic. However, I think this might work as an analytical framework to explain the degree of positive or, or negative interaction between the humanitarian field and, and the peacekeepers, peace, peace, peace builders. So, um, yeah, I will stop there. Um, thank you. Thank you very much, Kari. Uh, that's very useful to get that uh, analytical framework and, and to remind us of some of the the contextual and structural issues, I think, that are, that are of course, influencing this relationship. So let me move over to Christopher. Christopher is a senior research fellow at the Peace Research Institute in Oslo. Um, and um, I've also been instrumental in, in, in the Norwegian Center for Humanitarian Studies. So Christopher, over to you, please. Thanks a lot. And uh, as part of your center as well, and uh, a big fan of of that uh, work, I'm very happy to see this uh, collaboration today between the two centers. Uh, I thought the, the three uh, presentations really gave uh, an excellent uh, view into this uh, complicated relationship. And um, what I would uh, like to sort of request, because I thought all the speakers managed to show how this is a complicated uh, relationship, but um, uh, an even more complicated question is how it, this relationship looks within the broader domestic political landscape in these three uh, countries and whether that can tell us something about the, um, uh, how both keep peacekeeping and humanitarian assistance uh, works and uh, also how the interconnection between those two uh, uh, plays out. So, um, all, all the presentations started out with a focus on, you know, the conflicts, uh, the humanitarian needs, and how the national uh, responses uh, are devised to meet that. And I think, w at least when it comes to humanitarian assistance, it's this is the typical uh, approach and. Um, somehow um, abstracting from the local political struggles that uh, that this is part of. I know that none of the presenters actually, you know, in their analysis uh, do that, but when we um, think in particular about humanitarian assistance, that's often how it's uh, done. So my challenge to the three presenters would be to say something about who in the domestic political context uh, gains and loses from the success or failure of both the peacekeeping efforts and the humanitarian efforts and whether that can then help us understand better uh, both the individual trajectories of those two efforts and also their interconnection. Uh, so a sort of a political analysis of the international assistance. Would that be too much to ask for perhaps, but uh, I'm hopeful for at least some, some indications. Otherwise, uh, I'm also curious uh, to hear about your ideas about the longer term prospects of these conflicts. Um, you know, if both peacekeeping and humanitarian assistance is successful, what will, what situation will it end up with? Uh, will that take us to the sort of political situation that uh, would be sort of self-sustaining? Um, so is the success of peacekeeping and the success of the humanitarian assistance really the goal in this setting? Or um, what should be the overarching kind of 
vision that these uh, efforts should be adjusted to. Yeah, those are my two questions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Christopher. And like uh, usual, not not easy questions uh, from you, but I think uh, very very interesting and insightful questions. So we'll we'll see if the panelists, but also we're going to open up now to to uh, to the rest of us who are part of this conversation. So maybe there are others also who would like to to follow up on 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 those uh, very interesting questions uh, that you've that you've posed uh, to the group and and to the panel. But let me first say, I think you you win the uh, backdrop picture for today. We, we all wish we were you and sitting outside somewhere and, and, uh, and instead of uh, inside a, an office or in a, a building. Lovely. So um, colleagues, now we, we're opening up the floor. I see we've got 38 people in, in this conversation. Uh, so we're a little bit uh, more than, than we originally planned, which is fantastic, but which may mean that that uh, it's a little bit more difficult to manage our conversation. So we, I'm sure we're all familiar with the uh, Zoom at this point in time. So please raise your hand if you would like to, to uh, join the conversation. And can I ask you to uh, please try to limit your comment, your question, your engagement to, to one minute or so, so that many of us can, can join the conversation. Towards the end, I will um, ask the panelists to, to and uh, and the uh, discussants if they have any comments that they would like to to pose. Um, uh, but mostly, I would like to give the the, the floor now to for for a while to to our um, uh, the rest of the colleagues in the conversation. Uh, please, those of you who are not talking, mute yourself so we make sure we've got good sound quality. So first I see Alicia Kugel from uh, ZIF. Uh, Alicia, nice that you can join us. Uh, please take the floor. Yeah, thank you very much. And thank you for everyone. I keep my thanks short, so I have more time for my question. Um, this theme um, is, is really interesting to us. I'm from the Center for International Cooperation, uh, sorry, <laughs> International Peace Operations in Berlin. I used to be with the Center on International Cooperation in New York, but not, no longer. Um, so yeah, the, it, this issue is very important to us. And um, my question, uh, or maybe it's more of a comment, is that um, the presentation focused on three very large peacekeeping operations. And I wonder if in your um, research, you're also considering other peace operations that are uh, smaller in scale, um, for example, also integrated missions where the deputy um, SRSG is also the humanitarian coordinator for the UN country team, for example, and to see if the relationship between humanitarian actors and peace operations in these um, contexts are different. That would be my first one. <clears throat> and the second one, maybe um, other colleagues from the humanitarian uh, field would also comment on that more, but I wonder if we could also turn around the question and see how um, peace operations, um, or moreover, how humanitarian actors can enable peace operations to do their job a little bit better. And that is by um, giving them more access to um, what is mainly considered a better uh, conflict analysis from the humanitarian actors uh, in many conflict zones, <clears throat> as well as um, better technology. Um, often they're equipped much, with much better and newer technology than peace operations are, for example. Um, so those are my two comments. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Alicia. Um, I don't see anybody else who've got their hands up. Uh, colleagues, feel, please uh, feel free to, to join into the conversation. But uh, whilst nobody else is asking for the floor, I'm going to go back to the panel and ask if you have um, any comments on the questions that Alicia posed and that Christopher posed and, and on uh, Kari's uh, comment um, and continue the conversation in that way. Um, I'll maybe go in reverse order and then ask Lise first and then go to Natasha and then Carlo and, and, and yeah, if you have any comments you want to add. So let me start with Lise. Sure, thank you so much. Thank you, um, Carrie, Christopher and Alicia for your comments and, and your questions. Um, uh, who, 
Who gains and loses from the success or failure of peacekeeping and humanitarian efforts? I mean, that is a question that is actually not, um, uh, it's not obvious uh, how to answer it. I mean, in, in many cases and in the statistical research, we're seeing that um, uh, very often peace operations are assisting governments, right? And so I feel like there is this, um, worrying trend that I've written about before, um, where peace operations and, and humanitarians are implicated also because they're so closely tied to peacekeepers, um, that they are winding up supporting governments, uh, which means that in some cases we can be veering toward the realm of counterinsurgency and I will note that all three of our missions have stabilization in the title and stabilization, of course, is one of the main goals of counterinsurgency of the counterinsurgency of the US led counterinsurgency campaigns in Iraq and Afghanistan. So, um, so we have a trend towards stabilization, which leads to this question about long term prospects <laughs> and and I, I, I I'm feeling a little bleak. I'm an op optimistic person in general by nature. But um, given COVID, given disagreements between great powers, given the rise of anti-everything sentiment, um, uh, I I'm not seeing increasing space for, for, um, for dialogue. Sometimes I see it, sometimes I see flickers of hope, but in, in the general contours of it, I'm, I'm a little bit, um, I'm a little bit less hopeful. But so, Alicia, I wanted to ask you if you have specific operations in mind. Um, but I'll turn it over. I'll let you answer after my other, my fellow panelists say something. Well, let me ask Alicia to, to just respond to that question before, before I go to Natasha. Alicia? Uh, gladly. Um, one that came to mind directly, of course, is the uh, UN mission in Somalia, a political mission that is also an integrated one um, that has also a long history of, I think, difficulties um, working with humanitarian actors. Nonetheless, it is an integrated mission and um, works closely with humanitarian actors there. Uh, another one I could think of is the, the mission in Guinea-Bissau. It's a peace building office considered a peace operation, because that's the title of, um, of the panel today. It wasn't just a focus on peacekeeping, as I understood it. Um, they are also, um, I think they're working quite closely on peace building tasks, at least uh, together with humanitarian actors. Um, of course, these are very different settings than the ones that we talk about. Uh, and I think, I would think that um, the less conflict there is, the greater the level of cooperation could be between peace operations and humanitarian actors. But um, I just wondered, in, in order to complete sort of the picture, because there are so many different uh, peace operations in various contexts, if you also looked at missions that are not, you know, the three biggest um, peacekeeping operations, they are in the hardest, probably, conflicts and the long lasting ones so far. Thank you, Alicia. I think that's really interesting because by looking at the, you know, the, the bigger multidimensionals, we, we, we tend to then look at the military civilian interface or military humanitarian interface uh, but the the missions that you mentioned really put us more back into the broader political humanitarian uh, dimension and uh, Rolf uh, Swedhoff in the chat also referred to the the triple nexus uh, and uh, gives us a good link there to, to some work that they've done on that area but that's I think a very very interesting and broadening of, of the conversation thank you for that so let me turn to Natasha next Hey, yeah, thank you so much for these uh, really interesting points and um, comments. Um, I was just actually thinking a little bit about um, the point that Kari made about the center of gravity, because what is kind of interesting is that in all of these contexts, even though the humanitarians obviously have a very clear mandate um, in, in the sense that they need to deliver assistance to the populations in need, from the perspective of the local population, you actually have a wide variety of actors who are, in a sense, providing goods and services to the population. And that is from the humanitarian actors, from the UN mission, even from the French counter-terror operation, um, as well as actually the armed groups themselves. 
um, are also competing in a sense to provide sort of better services, better access to justice. And in, in, and in areas which are really vulnerable and where people are really suffering from, you know, you know levels of, of, of food insecurity, um, these kind of issues, are, you know, are a matter of life and death. And, and, you know, for these, for the people on the ground, I don't really think, um, you know, uh, yeah, it's, it, it's, it's not easy to, to it, it, it may not matter, <laughs> essentially, for the people on the ground. Um, and I just think it's, it's interesting in terms of thinking, you know, the, the center of gravity is in the sense winning, you know, um, some level of support from, from the civilian population, especially um, from, you know, the stabilization actors. Um, however, of course, for the civilian population, um, they they would like to be in a situation where they can have some level of predictability and certainty. And while we often, um, you know, think that uh, armed groups um, are responsible for, you know, uh, higher, you know, levels of conflict and violence in some areas, they are also responsible for for introducing some level of instability. So it's a very kind of it's a very complicated um, it's a very complicated question. Um, the second point that I wanted to to say was about you know how this relationship looks in the domestic political context. So what's interesting about Minusma is that there are really divergent expectations of what the mission should be doing. Um, some people really feel strongly that the mission should be engaged in counter-terror operations. Um, and that's why they've become, they've been perceived to be very unpopular. Um, others really perceive that they should be providing humanitarian assistance and development, especially the civilian population. Um, I would say that humanitarian actors in general um, you know, their, their role is less political. So I think that there is more sort of acceptance and legitimacy for what they're trying to do. Um, but when you look at the level of, you know, the, how the support for MINUSMA, the level of popular support has really gone downhill. Um, and this can, you know, you can see this th through the, you know, the, the demonstrations that have been ongoing in Bamako this summer. Um, which have also been um, sort of very anti the Western stabilization effort. Um, and in terms of sort of long term prospects, I really actually strongly believe that now for Mali, you know, it's finding a way of making the humanitarian peace operation relationship better is going to actually be completely pivotal to turning the situation around in central Mali. Because there, I think the priority is really re-establishing re a sense of security. And here you have a very clear role of MINUSMA, which is one of the only actors who can really um, contribute to providing that protection of civilians. Um, and in addition to that, you need to have the humanitarian support around because of the impending uh, humanitarian crisis, which is only getting worse. So I think, I think you know, the the, the immediate priority, um, while sustainable peace and stability might be a long way off, it's actually re-establishing a, a, a semblance of security for people um, to you know ha live basically better daily lives at the moment. Thank you. Thank you very much, Tasha. Then Carlo. Yes, um, thanks for these interesting inputs and, and questions. Uh, I had some time to think about it now since the others uh, responded, which was good. Um, so I, I think this point about the interaction between local stakeholders, um, and you're right actually, you now we, we focus so much on, on the UN missions and, and, and focus on, on basically the, the dominant actors, which are the armed groups, right? And much of the debate often focuses on on these kind of uh, meso level, right, the, the organizations, and basically leaves out the the very local level of this equation. I think you you hit the nail on the head when you say uh, not just who benefits or who doesn't benefit, but also what are, is their role in um, basically peace building, local level peace building, and also supplying um goods and services on their own so local populations and i think that's really one of at least for me a really exciting new research strand 
that kind of has really grown in the last uh, five to ten years. Um, so a lot of uh, a lot of like rigorous studies that show that in different contexts, actually different uh, conflict and post-conflict contexts, that have shown based on on representative uh, survey data plus qualitative evidence that people, when they're exposed to violence in civil wars, right, uh, people on average basically tend to um, get active, socially active, politically active. Uh, they engage in local level peace building. Uh, try to bridge gaps between um, different ethnic groups. So there is a lot, somewhat inbuilt reconciliation mechanism that kind of is being kicked off by exposure to violence. Now, the mechanisms how that works is not really that well understood so far. So there are a number of social psychological processes that appear to be going on, things like post-traumatic growth, but also that people um, have to cooperate during crisis and conflict out of a sheer necessity because the state is often absent or unwilling to provide security and basic services and to be quite frank um, most of the time local people um, provide their own the things they need by themselves right so humanitarian actors do not service every person in a conflict setting because the access is so difficult right so i think this is one of these uh, notions that is uh, lingering in my head, uh, which I somewhat term um, local outcrowding, outcrowding of, of uh, reconciliation, reconciliatory capacities, actually. And I think you have, on the one hand, this, this literature that provides across different uh, cases and, and uh, episodes of violence that people have this, this potential to cooperate and to leverage resources. Um, but on the other side, uh, you have you have this upcoming evidence also based on a lot of like uh, randomized controlled trials and impact evaluations that shows that all of these peace building um, interventions, often at the sm at, at the local level, they don't work that well, right? So often includes that you have these uh, unconditional cash transfers that are often used to kind of leverage local. Uh, social cooperation where, where you want to get people together and just and, and tell them here's like ten thousand dollars put up a committee write down the priorities that you need and the idea is of course to support this creation of basic services but also to support local cooperation because we know right that this sort of social trust that we have in conflict affected uh, societies in increasing the social trust is an important determinant for post-conflict social political and economic recovery right but the evidence suggests it doesn't really work that well right so there is this uh, there is this this problem i think that we could do more harm by these interventions if they are not really well designed because we can't crowd out this local level um reconciliatory capacities and i think that's something that i haven't seen much much research to discuss it with these controversies actually but i think it's important actually because you don't want to destroy it, you want to nurture it actually, right? Because that's that's what helps to keep countries in a post-conflict setting out of conflict. The, the probability that, that conflict re-emerges is quite high as we know, right? So everything we can do to avoid any negative or adverse effects actually is important. And um, I think the evidence also shows, and I've been involved in impact evaluations that have shown that massive, uh, massive peace building efforts can result, especially if there is a lot of resources involved, can result in adverse side effects where it creates local level envy, where it creates competition and conflicts over where development projects are being set up, who gets jobs, who gets resources. So a lot of that is going on under the radar. And it's very difficult, of course, to, um, to, um, to capture that in um, both qualitative and quantitative studies, but that doesn't mean that it's not going on, right? Thank you very much, Carlo. Uh, a number of very important points that you've, that you've raised there, and I think the, the um, very high risk of uh, harm that can be caused by international interventions, international presences, uh, by, as you say, overwhelming or crowding out or taking up the space of, of local actors, local reconciliation. I think those are very important points. 
I see Lisa's got a hand up and then I'm gonna to go to Yvonne after that. Please. Great, yes, I, I was hoping to encourage Yvonne to raise his hand also. Um, yeah, um, so I, Carlo, I, I think that what you're getting at is, is whether the external, you know, whether external efforts are substituting or in some ways crowding out local capacity, both at a local level, but also at the national level, right? I mean, this is one thing, this is one of the reasons why the government and DRC wants MONUSCO to leave, right? They're, they're, they're fed up with having, I mean, on the one hand, the UN doesn't want to become the security force of the government, but on the other hand, the government is, already, is, is kind of, well, becoming more ready to stand on its own. But I had a question for Natasha, and it's a very specific question, but I hope that it could come, it could get to something um, impor maybe important, I don't know. But in, the gra in one of your graphs that you showed um, where the level of violence, um, I can just describe what happened. From 2014 to 2016, we saw uh, the violence levels go down dramatically from in 2014 to 2016, and then they rose back up. And I wonder what was happening in Mali in that two year interim period. And I don't know if you'll have the answer to that. And I would just note that there was a similar two year interim period in the Central African Republic between 2014 and 2016, when the levels of violence decreased dramatically, refugees were turning home, IDPs were turning home, the economy actually grew for the first time in a while. So things were turning around for a couple of years, and then they went back. And that's, you know, one of my questions is, is how do you get it to start working? And then what happened to, so that it wasn't working again? Thank you very much. Natasha, I'm going to give you a chance to think about that. And then I'm first going to go to Ivan. Uh, Ivan Ilunga, as uh, Lise mentioned, is one of uh, the co-authors of the EFON study on the UN mission in the, of the, in, to the effectiveness of the UN mission in Central Africa public, MINUSCA. And uh, Lise also mentioned that Ivan has just got his book out to release today. Or So Ivan, please, uh, it'll be great to, to hear from you as well. You've got the floor. Well, thank you so much, uh, Cedric and uh, Liz and uh, everyone. It's always good to, to chat with you all. And uh, it's quite interesting to, to see this, uh, I think this conversation, as most of you know probably that uh, the synergy between humanitarian and uh, development started quite uh, a few years ago. So it, for me, I, I was expecting this one to also come up, especially when it comes to peacekeeping uh, operations and, uh, and humanitarian because of the timing when these two operations or activities happen, most of them happen within uh, conflict season while development come a little bit after. So I think this is quite timely, but I will not take that much time. I will just try to highlight three things based on what was said. And, uh, and I think to push a little bit, some reflections on where probably this conversation could go in terms of studies and uh, practice. One is, uh, uh, I think, uh, Carlos and Natasha, within your presentation, you have mentioned an issue of perception and how uh, UN missions have become targets or somehow badly assessed. Of course, this is also uh, the case for CAR, but I think for the DRC and Mali, it's quite interesting, but I'm probably thinking of one reason or one or two. One is, uh, you know, for instance, for MONUSCO, uh, the mission has lasted long and within the ground, people feel like it has been ineffective, not based on the activities, but based on the duration of the mandate. It's been changing, but conflict is not somehow handing. And I think I would assume that might be the case in Mali as well. Although the mission in Mali might not be as long as MONUSCO, but the fact that you have many uh, operations happening and uh, they're becoming more and more elastic. So local communities are getting tired of seeing uh, the presence of UN all the time. While for instance, in the Eastern part, as Carlo mentioned earlier of the DRC, you have 
a huge increase in uh, uh, target and conflict and, uh, and killing. So which I think might be one of the reasons that is kind of fueling this negative perceptions of the missions. And the second perception, the reason for the perception might also be uh, some political messaging and narrative. You know, uh, in uh, the DRC, for instance, you will hear, especially uh, before 2018, there was this idea of saying MONUSCO is trying to become like a, uh, a government within the nation. So, and that political narrative, sometimes it's affected or is, uh, is affected the perception at the local level because most of the people who are pushing for such narratives are um, opinion leaders within their own uh, regions and places. So I'll go to the second point is uh, what Liz also mentioned, for instance, the regional aspect. Within the peacekeeping operation, there's been that understanding of looking into uh, regional dimensions of conflict and somehow bringing in uh, regional organization in strengthening uh, the peace and security. But this hasn't happened uh, when it comes to issues of humanitarian assistance, especially in the car or the DRC, for instance. And uh, as Liz mentioned, uh, the closing of the border between Car and Cameroon and a little bit of the DRC uh, created a certain humanitarian crisis by itself. So I'm um, uh, assuming that if we can look into uh, how to expand one country's humanitarian uh, crisis within and see it within its regional uh, dynamic and see how we can still create a flow of good if those may come from outside regions that will somehow sustain uh, the peace and uh, hopefully alleviate a little bit of the crisis and uh, the burden on humanitarian aspect. So I'll finish with one suggestion when it comes to probably the study. Uh, the situational analysis of conflict or the assessment or crisis assessment when it comes to peacekeeping is done differently as when it is done within the humanitarian context. So I'm thinking maybe it might be useful to create an inclusive framework uh, of assessment. That way both uh, forces, if I, call, I may call them that way, or both legs of these uh, interventions can have the same uh, metrics of assessing uh, the crisis, assessing vulnerability, and therefore developing some sense of uh, uh, inclusive framework for security, peace, as well as humanitarian uh, assistance. So these are some of the things that I wanted to uh, contribute with. Thank you. Thank you very much, Juan, for that uh, contribution. Uh, I'm going to go to Natasha to so give a chance to answer Lisa's question. Natasha, if you can try to stick to a minute. And then I'll, I'll wrap up and I'll pass on to Andrea, who's going to make some closing remarks as well. Thank you very much. Yeah, um, yeah, I'll, I'll be very quick. So um, essentially what was happening in that period was that you have a huge concerted effort to stabilize Northern Mali. So you had the signing of the peace agreement in 2015. Um, you, you have the French counter-terror force, which has been focused basically on dispelling the Islamist insurgency, which controlled uh, Northern Mali um, you know, for a six month period uh, in 2012 to 2013. Um, but what happens is that the international community is so focused on stabilizing the North that the warning signs that were going off about the center of the country destabilizing was simply not being heard, um, despite the fact that um, you know, um, there were very clear signs that the situation was deteriorating. The Islamist insurgency had already begun mobilizing in the center of Mali um, even before the 2012 crisis broke out. Um, but essentially, when you know we really saw violence started ramping up in central Mali, which was from approximately January 2015, um, by the time you know it took the mission 
to react, um, it was sort of very much already well entrenched. Um, now you have, you know, these Islamist groups who are, who control large parts of central Mali and who have incited um, into communal violence. But it took three years really from the visibility of seeing attacks in central Mali in 2015 to the mission incorporating central Mali in its mandate in 2018. So it essentially took three years to sort of make that turnaround, um, uh, making it very difficult to sort of turn the tide of, of violence which had already taken hold. Thanks. Thank you very much. Um, and thank you really everyone for, for a really interesting and, and uh, I think very um, rich discussion. Um, I'm going to I mean, just may say a few things from my side, wrapping up. I think what I heard from everyone is that we have this kind of coexistence between peace operations and uh, humanitarian action, which are somewhat on, on the one hand uh, necessary and, and, and complementary and in, enabling in terms of access and so on, but also very complex and uh, also at times um, uh, harmful in to in in both towards both directions, and I think to to build on what Kari said and and to to try also to perhaps respond to some of the questions from Christopher, uh, how we see political actors, domestic actors uh, respond to both peacekeeping and and humanitarian action. I think for especially uh, armed groups uh, that are either inspired ideologically or, or politically, uh, the distinction between the two is not very significant, probably. I mean, they see both as somehow representing an external effort to, to, to intervene, to support what they perhaps see as kind of a ruling class or governing regime, um, or kind of a Western uh, intervention in terms of a cultural approach. And I think uh, cynically also many of the political actors see, see both equally as you know, opportunities for rent seeking and opportunities for, 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 for economic gain. Um, so I think that's, that's some of the dimensions that, that we see. And that also leads me to think in terms of the question you asked Christopher about goals. I think both, uh, both humanitarian action and peace operations uh, contribute to an enabling environment for political process. Uh, I think uh, Lise mentioned the, the kind of window opportunity period in Kaur, uh, Natasha just discussed the same in, in Mali. So we often do see that uh, these efforts do create moments uh, that, that create more stability and that potentially could have been used for, for political process on the transitions. But unfortunately, very often the conditions aren't there for whatever reasons to really take forward the, on the political transition. And I think uh, one element there, which Carlo also touched on is that um, very often, I think through humanitarian action and through, uh, through peacekeeping operations, some of the dynamics which are needed for political solutions are, are interrupted in the sense that some of the tensions are alleviated, which would otherwise have caused the kind of feedback that would have caused political actors to, to and local and other actors to find solutions, to work on solutions, to find political compromises. But if these problems are somehow solved by others, that alleviates in a sense that, that stimulus or that pressure to, to find uh, home, homegrown solutions. So I think overall, we need to be much more sophisticated in terms of the design of the actions. We need to be much more aware of, of the harm, not just uh, harm in the way of uh, uh, kind of more the traditional way perhaps we think about it, but also harm in the way Carlo highlighted the, the kind of an interruption or disruption of, of local resilience, uh, local efforts, local abilities to step up and local reconciliation efforts and so on. So these are some of the thoughts that I came back out of with. Thank you very much for a very rich discussion. I'm going to ask Jenny to put the poll up so that uh, we have a chance before we leave each other to quickly give our opinion on, on the poll. And then I'm going to hand over to Andrea, um, from, who's from Priu, and um, who represents the Norwegian Center for Humanitarian Studies. So uh, Andrea, I would like you to, to perhaps say a few closing words. Thank you very much. 
Thank you very much, uh, Cedric, and thank you so much to all our presenters, discussants, and everyone for participating in this uh, discussion. Uh, I think, uh, perhaps unsurprisingly, the uh, question that uh, started this whole uh, seminar, whether the relationship between peace operations and humanitarian operations is mainly enabling or harmful, um, what we have reached uh, in terms of answering that question today is that it is complicated uh, and it very much depends on which aspect we analyze it from, whether we look at security, power politics, global or local dynamics, uh, or logistics and uh, access. Um, and uh, this is actually a very nice bridge into another event that we're hosting on the 1st of October. It's called uh, the Front Lines of Diplomacy, Humanitarian Negotiations with uh, Armed Groups, um, uh, which is led by our colleague Salla Turunen from uh, CMI. So if you have an interest in this aspect, I would encourage you to participate also in that. It's a hybrid meeting, so you can participate in person in Bergen or virtually over Zoom. Um, the NCHS is uh, first and foremost a hub for a discussion between practitioners and researchers. And uh, events like this is sort of the reason why we were uh, founded and uh, what we aim to do. So I also encourage uh, all of you, if you have not signed up to our contact list already, to go to humanitarianstudies.no and uh, connect with us there. You can also follow um, our general opinions in, form, in the form of blog posts and news from that site. And we are also on both Twitter and Facebook. So uh, with that, I think uh, I'll hand it back to you, uh, Cedric. Thanks again, everyone, for uh, your great uh, participation. Thanks, Andrea. Thank you, everyone, for joining us. Thanks to our panelists and our discussants. A great discussion, and um, I hope you have an uh, enjoyable rest of your day. Thank you very much, everyone. That's a wrap then. Thank you.